Welcome back, guys. So we're continuing um, chapter um, one or two point one, but we're deviating from the book at this point, um, which we actually do a lot. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about now is we've been talking about drawing, right? And I want to talk about a very popular form of drawing, um, comic books. And now comic books are part of a kind, uh, a category of art we call illustration. And so what, uh, how illustration differs from what we've been studying mostly, which has been what we categorize as fine art, is that fine art is meant to stand alone. Fine art is something that is hung on a wall in a gallery or put on a pedestal in a museum. Uh, and it is art that is meant to stand on its own, that uh, whose meaning is derived from itself. So when you look at a work of art, the idea is that that artwork is complete. But an illustration is an image that illustrates a text that tells the story of something that is already written. And so this can take the form of, you know, of an advertising art. This could take the form of a, of a, a book cover, a movie poster. Uh, the idea is that there is already another story that exists, and this is simply illustrating it. And in uh, a lot of cases, illustration is a commercial art. Illustrators are hired by individuals or companies to create artworks uh, that go along with to uh, advertise or to help sell or to, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, a, a previously existing uh, text, okay? And in the art world, illustrators and illustration often don't get the same sort of respect that fine artists do. And I, I think that this is a tragedy in a way. And it's maybe a little dramatic, over dramatic of a word. I don't know if it's a tragedy, but um, it is, I, I think it's a disservice. Let's put it that way. Because I think that a lot of the great artists have been illustrators. And I think some of the most influential artists have been illustrators. Uh, and I want to talk specifically today about a very popular form of illustration, comic books, but also a, a, um, a category of illustration that has gotten a lot of um, sort of negativity in the art world. But despite this sort of negativity and the, despite the fact that uh, comics and illustrators in general don't often get compared to the great artist, um, as I said, I, I, I would say that many of these many of the great illustrators are as influential as any of the great fine artists. And maybe since they are popular artists, this, you know, seen by millions and millions of people, maybe even more influential. So let's jump back. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. Well, not the very beginning, because... Um, you know, comics are, are kind of hard to find, uh, hard to define. Because what is a comic? I mean, I think at its simplest, a comic is uh, an illustration where the dialogue and the description is integrated into the image, right? So as opposed to having a picture with text underneath it, uh, the, the dialogue and the action is explained in words within the picture itself. And, you know, this, this is something that goes all the way back if you think about, like, ancient Egypt and the hieroglyphs, um, you know, and words and pictures sort of intermingling. This is something that goes all, you know, all the way back to the oldest civilizations. And there's examples, you know, all throughout the world. In ancient China, the ancient Aztecs had uh, books that we could basically call comics. But as far as sort of, sort of the modern use, um, you know, comics really develop in the late 1800s. And to understand the comic book, we need to understand the comic strip, or as it was called, the funny pages. Uh, so in, in uh, the 19th century, newspapers were the main way that people got their news, of course. And um, people would subscribe to newspapers, sometimes several newspapers. Most large cities had several different newspapers with varying uh, viewpoints. You know, some were more conservative or liberal or in between, or uh, some focused on different kinds of stories. And so a lot of people uh, subscribed to different, uh, different newspapers. And most newspapers, uh, by the mid to late 1800s, uh, started to publish comics. And these comics became very, very popular. In fact, you're looking at 
uh, what is arguably the first popular uh, American comic strip character, a character named the Yellow Kid. And the, the Yellow Kid was um, a character that was uh, published in uh, two different New York newspapers who was a um, sort of a stereotype character based on um, immigrants uh, living in New York at the time. The, the uh, Yellow Kid was set in a a very uh, uh, sort of poor area, rough area of town, and and this kid was shown, um, you know, as uh, wearing a nightshirt with no shoes, and became a very sort of popular uh, character. His his head was shaved because he had lice. So this was all sort of commentary on, on the time. And uh, at, at this time in New York, billboards, pa big painted billboards, were just kind of becoming a thing. And so the yellow kids would often. Um, wear this nightshirt with uh, different words on it, sort of reacting to the story as kind of a parody, as kind of a commentary on billboards at the time. You know, we don't even think about billboards anymore, but uh, in the late 1800s, they were sort of a big deal and they were worth commenting on. And it was evidently quite hilarious, uh, something like this in the 1800s. Um, so The Yellow Kid was a really popular comic. Um, but the, uh, uh, what happened is uh, the publishers started to publish uh, reprints and also new stories by the artist, uh, Richard F. Alcult, uh, Alcult, I should say. And uh, these are really some of the first American comic books. And there's some others that we could trace back in the early 19th century, but for all intents and purposes, it's, you know, we're going to start here. <laughs> we're going to start with the Yellow Kid. If you want to do some more research and dig deeper at some older stuff, you can. But uh, for all intents and purposes, this is the first comic book. Although it's, it's not really a comic book as we know it today. It wasn't published with sort of that, the same uh, intent. Um, but it was a collection of of comic stories. Now, these these newspaper funny pages were a big deal. They were they were really they were really important. People loved these characters. These characters became very well known, and the comic creators became um, many of them were celebrities in their own right. Um, these are two very popular comics from the time. Uh, one called Blondie, and one called Gasoline Alley. Uh, uh, created by uh, a guy named Chick Young for Blondie, and Gasoline Alley was made by a guy named Frank King. And both these guys were big names, and they made a lot of money and had a lot of prestige. And if you look at the art of these comics, you'll see that they're rather quite beautiful in a way. Um, especially Gasoline Alley, if you look at this incredible two-point perspective, um, I guess really it's more of an isometric perspective. Um, uh, but if you look at this really wonderful, beautiful perspective here, it's really quite something. This is uh, some really kind of advanced techniques going on here. And then the way the artist has broken this one singular picture into smaller panels, it's, it's really quite ahead of its time. Um, and and uh, many of these comics were, um, a comic artist were, uh, you know, uh, went to various art academies and were classically trained. Uh, artist. And that brings us to sort of the comic book that we all know and love. So the first modern comic books were published in the 1930, and you're looking at some of the first. There's debate on what exactly the first sort of American comic book that was published as a comic book, meant to sold at newsstands, and meant to be read in the way we read comic books today. Uh, there's debates on whether it's Funnies on Parade or this other one called Famous Funnies, and I, I don't know, and in all honesty, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Um, these are all early, early comic books. And the earliest publishers, um, and Funnies on Parade is arguably the first, but a, a company called Eastern Color Printing decided that um, you know, what if, what if we can make a little extra money by taking some of these newspaper comic strips that had already been published, but, you know, you know, previously, years ago, and we reprint them, and we print them on cheap newsprint, we fold it, you know, in quarters and make a little book out of it, put a staple down the spine, slap a cover on it, and sell it for 10 cents a piece. How would that sell? 
Well, it turns out it sold incredibly well. And, and so these first comics basically were just reprints of previously published comic strips. Now, this being the 1930s and the Great Depression, comics became very, very popular because they were inexpensive. They could be sort of passed around among friends and family. They could be read on your lunch break at work or on the bus ride to work. And when you were done, well, you just threw them away or you used the, the pages to line the litter box or whatever it was. Uh, we used to wrap presents with, with the funny pages out of newspapers anyway. Um, I'm old. But these, these were incredibly popular, and not just among children. Um, you know, co early comics told all sorts of stories. They told sort of funny stories. They, there were a lot of Western comics. There were mysteries and thrillers and spy stories. There were even soap operas and romances and things like that. And men, women, and children all read comic books. And they were, inc and they were incredibly... Um, they were incredibly popular. But radio started to uh, gain traction in the 1930s and 1940s, and then eventually by the 1950s, comics were more or less abandoned by adults, and they became considered to be something that pretty much kids, children exclusively, read. And one of the reasons for this is the publication of this comic. Action Comics number one. And Action Comics number one introduced the story of Superman. We're going to watch a video in class, so I'm not going to get into all the details of the origins of Superman, but Siegel and Schuster were two kids, two Jewish immigrant kids uh, living in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1930s, who um, came up with this idea. Uh, Jerry Siegel was the writer and Joe Schuster was the artist. They came up with this idea about Superman. And this is an, uh, something they shopped around for a bunch of different comic companies for a number of years, about five years or so, until um, National Comics, which later on would become DC Comics, decided to uh, publish it. And it was Action Comics number one was an immediate, immediate hit. Um, and it told the story of, as you as you know, of a basically a refugee from a uh, a planet uh, whose son has gone nova, and he comes to Earth, and he is adopted by uh, human parents, and he is raised as a human, but he develops superpowers, and he decides to use these superpowers for good, and to help and save people and fight crime, and so they created this incredibly popular character called Superman. Now, Superman was um, not the first superhero, but he's really the first very popular superhero, and he's really the, the hero that, that starts to change comics uh, to be almost exclusively thought of something uh, that tells superhero stories. Although there were still, you know, westerns and, and crime stories and other kinds of things being published, um, you know, throughout the decades, uh, superheroes kind of become to dominate um, comics because in 1938, Siegel and Schuster published Action Comic Number One with Superman, uh, and everybody imitated Superman. Now, the interesting thing about Siegel and Schuster is they actually made very little money uh, from Superman. Uh, they didn't own the rights to Superman, and this is a problem with a lot of the early comic book companies is that these artists um, these artists often didn't make a lot of money because they didn't own the rights to their characters. The companies they worked for did. So that means Siegel and Schuster didn't see any of the residuals for all of the things that super, you know, any sort of item, any sort of product with Superman's name on it that had been sold or any other comics that were not, of uh, Superman comics that were not written by him. And so this is, if you think about that, I mean, think about every Superman item that has ever been sold since 1938, and think about the total net of that. It's absolutely astronomical. I mean, you're looking at you know, billions of dollars, maybe tens of billions of dollars in revenue that Siegel and Schuster saw 
almost none of. Um, in the 1970s, when the first big Superman movie was released, they actually sued DC Comics, and they, they made uh, some money uh, off of it uh, then. And then a few decades later, their family sued again, and they made uh, several hundred million dollars. But it's still just a drop in the bucket. Um, but this is something evidently that is not uncommon. That was not uncommon in the early days of. Uh, the comic book companies, because comics in many ways were the opposite of comic strips. Comic books um, had sort of a bad reputation, because oftentimes the art was not great, the writing was sometimes, or usually, let's say, poor, and sometimes the stories were, you know, salacious. They could be, um, uh, you know, gory or graphic or deal with sort of more kind of lurid, um, uh, subject matter. And because of this, comics were thought to be silly or ridiculous or something that only kids could read. And many people thought they were actually a bad influence on kids. In, fa in fact, in the 1950s, co Congress even held hearings questioning uh, comic book creators uh, because there was this real big sort of panic that comics were causing delinquency in children. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. But comic, comic creators were often treated very poorly and, you know, kind of depended on the company. And I've heard, I've read interviews and seen interviews with uh, some of these old comic book artists and writers, and some of them said, you know, actually things were not bad. We actually had a pretty good time. And others said it was absolutely horrible and that the environment was like working in sweatshop conditions where people were working 12 and 14 hour days, um, things like that, and getting paid very little. Once again, it kind of depended on the company and it kind of depended on the comic book artist and writer. Um, but many of the many of these writers and artists were young. They were still learning their craft and to be fair, a lot of these early comics are not very good and they're not very well written or very well drawn, but it didn't matter. They were literally meant to be disposable. And, you know, you buy them, you read them, and then you throw them away. Although, uh, I'm sure anybody who once owned Action Comics number one now regrets throwing it away, because I think at its most recent auction, this sold for something like $3.2 million. There's only, I don't remember the number, but there's only like a handful, like around a dozen or so, don't quote me on that, of these still in existence. And so they're very, very rare. And Superman being the most famous superhero in history, um, you can understand why this costs so much money. I want to talk now, though, about an artist named Jack Kirby. Because Jack Kirby, I would argue, is one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, and very few people outside of comic book fans know his name. But you know his work. If you've ever heard of Captain America, or the Fantastic Four, or Thor, or Iron Man, or the X-Men, or Silver Surfer, or Doctor Doom, or Black Panther, and all of Wakanda, then you are familiar with the work of Jack Kirby. But since he is a comic artist, he's not, you're not going to hear his name in the same way you would hear the name of Pablo Picasso or Andy Warhol. Um, Jack Kirby grew up in New York. He grew up very rough. He was the son of immigrants, and he grew up in uh, um, sort of on the streets, fighting in street gangs and uh, living kind of a rough childhood. But he had artistic talent. And as a young man, he started working for newspapers as an illustrator because he had to help his family put food on the table. And then eventually, Jack Kirby started working for a series of very of different uh, comic book companies. I think Fox Publishing was the first. He worked for, but he worked for several of the biggies. And eventually, um, by the 1940s, he's working for a company called Timely. Timely will, in the 1950s, become Atlas Comics, and in the 1960s, they'll change their name to, I think you might have heard of them, they're, they're called Marvel. Maybe? Okay. Um, so he's, he's working for Marvel uh, Comics, or Timely, as they were known at the time. And he and an editor and writer named Joe Simon uh, um, created a character called Captain America. And Captain America was a character created right before the U.S. involvement in World War II. It was published, although it says March of um, 
Yeah, it was published in March of 1941, so it's it's right before um, Pearl Harbor, and uh, you know uh, Hitler's Germany and uh, is already um, you know on their huge military campaign, and the war has already been going on a number of years by this point. And and Jack Kirby's very patriotic; he's very much for the war effort, and he creates a superhero very much in sort of the mode of Superman, because Superman, everybody imitated Superman, um, called Captain America, who was a super soldier. And in fact, in Captain America's very first comic, Captain America punches Hitler, right? Uh, punching a Nazi is the American way. And uh, here's Captain America doing his uh, duty for his country. And eventually, Jack Kirby would serve in the war. Um, he would go on to work in a, on a reconnaissance uh, team, or work as a reconnaissance um, soldier, and he, would, and he used his artistic ability to draw maps, and it was a very, very dangerous position. Jack Kirby was a, is a sort of little, very tough, rough guy. He was a guy who grew up in street gangs and getting into fist fights and things like that. He, uh, he was kind of a, um, a tough little guy. Um, but he, uh, you know, was very much a patriot and loved his country and wanted to sort of contribute to the war effort, as many people did back at that time. So Jack Kirby created Captain America, and it was a huge hit. I think the, the first comic sold something like a million uh, copies. Um, so it was, it was very successful. And Jack Kirby spent the, the sort of rest of his, uh, the next few decades, going from various comic companies to the comic companies. He even, at one point, had started his own comic book company with Joe Simon. But by the 1960s, he's back at Timely or Atlas or um, Marvel by that time. And, and uh, the guy who is running Marvel, is a, is a, the editor, is a guy named Stan Lee. And Stan Lee has, like Jack Kirby, already been in the business at this point um, for uh, over 20 years. I had to make a quick correction. So if you look down at the date, um, you'll notice this is 1961 now instead of 1941. So by the time we get to the 1960s, we're, we're in what is called the Silver Age of Comics. Um, the, from 1938, when Superman is first published, to 1956, we call this period the Golden Age. So now we're in the Silver Age of Comics. And uh, this is really where Marvel Comics comes of age. And, and so the, the editor of Marvel Comics is a guy named Stan Lee, who, like Jack Kirby, had been doing this a long time, and he was getting very dissatisfied. Stan Lee's... Uh, Stan Lee uh, thought that he would be, you know, write the great American novel and be the great American novelist, and comics would be a sideline. And 20 years later, uh, he's still working on comics, and he hates it because the co he hates the comics that he's producing. He thinks they're silly. He doesn't think they matter, and he doesn't think they really ki connect with kids. And so he's going to quit, and his wife says, give it one more shot. Write something you want to write. And so Stan Lee creates a group of superheroes called the Fantastic Four. And he does something different with them. He gives them problems. He, gets, he writes about their love lives. He writes about financial problems. He writes about um, tension between the heroes themselves. He writes these characters have doubts and fears. And um, they were very sort of humanized versions of superheroes. And it turns out this was a great idea. And these became, uh, the Fantastic Four became a phenomenal success. And Jack Kirby uh, co-created uh, the Fantastic Four along with Stan Lee. Jack Kirby did the art and Stan Lee wrote the stories. And so over the next 10, 15 years or so, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, and a bunch of other guys at Marvel Comics will end up creating sort of the great, um, some of the greatest superheroes in history. Characters like the Incredible Hulk, Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, I think you maybe have heard of him, um, Black, Black Panther, 
Um, list goes on and on and on. If you are a fan of the Marvel movies today, you are a fan of the work of Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and the many other men and women who were working at Marvel Comics at the time. And before I continue talking about Jack Kirby, I want to talk a little bit about the Comic Code's authority. Um, so, in the 1950s, um, Congress held a series of hearings about the negative influence that comics had on children. And part of the reason for this, in the 1950s, there was a series of horror comics that were very gory and violent that uh, people were afraid were a bad influence on children. And so, what the comic Various, the various comic book companies got together and they decided, look, we don't want some government body censoring us, so instead we will censor ourselves. We will form our own association, the Comic Magazines Association of America, as an alternative, uh, alternative to this government regulation, and uh, this way we can police ourselves and um, uh, um, we won't have to worry about the government doing it, doing it for us. And so what they basically did is they decided that you couldn't glorify violence. And here's a list of some of the things, like no crime shall be presented in a way to create sympathy for the criminal. Policemen, judges, governments, and officials and respected institutions shall never be presented in a way to create disrespect. Um, good shall always triumph over evil. Scenes of excessive, let me get, where's my thing? Scenes of excessive violence are to be prohibited. No brutal torture. No horror, excessive bloodshed. No profanity, obscenity, smut. No snudity or sex scenes. No perversions. That kind of stuff. And these basically remained in place until around 2001, until finally Marvel just went, eh. People had been ignoring it for a long time anyway, and so it was just more or less abandoned as sort of social mores changed, right? But this also, you know, sort of aided in this feeling that comics were caused delinquency. Comics were not something to be taken seriously. In fact, comics could have a negative effect on people. And so th this definitely aided in that kind of perception. And so when Jack Kirby and, and uh, um, Stan Lee started to initiate sort of what we call the Silver Age of Comics in the 1960s, you know, they were working under, as you can see here in the upper right-hand corner, this, this comics code, which you know, gave these rather strict sort of rules and regulations. So, in class, we're going to talk about Jack Kirby's art, and we're going to talk about really um, what makes it so dynamic. But I do want to look a little bit here. Um, this is a, a work by a guy named Kurt Swan of Superman, around the same time, so I, I want to give you a comparison. Now, you'll notice in Jack Kirby's work, the, the action is much more dramatic and dynamic, and he's doing some things here to make that happen. You'll notice the extreme foreshortening with this massive fist here uh, and the small boot in the background. This was something Jack Kirby learned from Renaissance art. Jack Kirby never w went to art school. He was not professionally trained. But he learned by going to the library and checking out books on Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. And he, over time, and you can actually see Jack Kirby getting better. I mean, if you compare the rather sort of flat, awkward-looking Captain America here compared to this Captain America made 40 years later, the differences are enormous. And not only do we have this exciting, dramatic sort of foreshortening, we have this use of linear perspective to give the world in the background sort of three-dimensional weight. Notice Jack Kirby fills his panels with just action everywhere. There's never a dull spot. There's always people or flames or buildings or something going on. And very famously, these little dots are known as Kirby dots. And in some cases, they're not meant to actually represent anything. They just, they're just there to fill the space and form these kind of abstract patterns that create something exciting to look at. And also what Jack Kirby did is he, he messed with the proportions of the figures. He exaggerated the proportions. Because Jack Kirby, I think better than anybody, 
understood that these are superheroes. These are these superheroes have more in common with Greek gods than they do with people who fight crime, right? The, with like a policeman or something. These are larger than life, bigger than life, unrealistic kinds of stories. And so Jack Kirby blew up these proportions. I mean, look at Captain America's shoulder. It's bigger than his head. His thigh is like the size of my entire torso. These are massive figures. And they're exciting and dramatic and they move in exciting ways with that foreshortening. And it's just a whole lot of fun to work at, look at. And if you, if you look at um, Superman over here with his dinky little ding, breaking his chains, it's rather boring. It's rather boring. Um, Jack Kirby, guys. Jack Kirby um, produced tens of thousands of, of pages of comics throughout his life. Uh, the, the standard comic book is 24 pages, more or less. Um, and each page is divided into a series of panels. Sometimes those panels, let me move my guy here, sometimes those panels can be one large panel, like the image on the left, or it can be smaller multiple panels. So Jack Kirby for any average comic book is drawing you know probably anywhere between 100 to 200 different panels of varying sizes. The way comic books were produced and still are relatively is, is kind of on an assembly line fashion. Um, it starts with a script so you would have, just like in a movie you have a script writer who would write the script and then you have the illustrator who draws everything in pencil. So Jack Kirby would draw everything in pencil. And then that pencil drawing is taken to an inker, somebody not Jack Kirby, who would then draw black ink over it. And then that is taken to a colorist who would add the color. And then that is add, taken to the letterer who would add the letters, the, the, the dialogue. Although Jack Kirby often did his own lettering as he drew. And so Jack Kirby sometimes is, would be, be working on two, three, four, and even on occasion five comic books in a month. And sometimes he would also be the writer of the comic books and book and not just the artist. So he was cranking out a tremendous amount of artwork. And if you look at these panels, you can really see his style. These are called the pencils or the pencil roughs. And in this image of Thor, um, I, I, you can in this bottom panel especially when Thor hits the ground it's not just with a thud but you have all of these lines just sort of streaking out everywhere and if you look in this panel here you can actually see the Kirby dots <laughs> so there they are um, so, and, and if you if you if you um, uh, look if you look at some of the Marvel movies uh, they actually add Kirby dots into them anyway um, Jack Kirby. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is a double page, known as a splash page, splash page of Black Panther that Jack Kirby did. And I love this. This to me is, is Jack Kirby um, 100%. And if you look at it closely, it, does, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like some of the figures, like where is Black Panther leaping from? And where is this guy coming from? And the angles are all weird. Some people are standing on the ground and others are sort of in the air, but you're not really sure where the ground line is or where. And you know what? It doesn't matter <coughs> because Jack Kirby doesn't really care about realism here. He wants excitement. He wants a page that's engaging. And if you look at, I mean, literally the dozens of things to look at on this page, it's just thrilling and exciting and it's a wonderful composition um, and Jack Kirby obviously hated negative space because there's very little of it here he, he had abho abhorred a vacuum and he filled every single inch with something to look at and the reason I'm spending so much time on Jack Kirby is because he's incredibly important um, he's without a doubt the most influential comic book artist of the 20th century and Jack Kirby, like many of his fellow artists, did not retain the rights or all of the rights to some of his characters. I think he had some share in Captain America, but he still made very little for creating 
many of these great characters. Now, he didn't die broke or penniless by any means, and certainly he's, his name is very recognized in the comic book world, but he didn't die a multimillionaire. You know, Jack Kirby um, you know, worked every day of his life to put food on the table for his family, uh, and that's one of the reasons why he drew so much. It's only been after he's di after he died that he's sort of gotten the credit and the recognition and that his family um, had a lawsuit against Marvel and they got a sizable um, income. And if you watch any Marvel movie, on the credits, one of the first names you'll see is created by Stanley, of course, Jack Kirby. Will Eisner is a really important figure in the history of comics. Will Eisner started working in the 1940s around the same time that Jack Kirby did. Will Eisner created a character called the Spirit, which was a very popular character in, in uh, newspapers back in the day. But Will Eisner is known also as the father of something called the graphic novel. A graphic novel is a long-form comic book. So a novel-length comic book. And in the 1970s, Will Eisner started to reconsider what comic books could do, what kinds of stories they could tell. And he was influenced by a lot of comics that are called underground comics, comics that were written by artists outside of the mainstream sort of superhero comics. And he wanted to tell more complicated stories, stories that were, you know, often questions people's morality or uh, tackled social problems, things like that. And he wrote a series of, of graphic novels, and the first one is called A Contract with God, which sort of uh, is based on his childhood. He grew up poor, he grew up in, a, in, in the slums of New York, and uh, he wanted to sort of document the seedier, darker side of modern American life. And his books weren't massive successes, but comic artists and writers loved them because they were adult. They were long-form comics. They told complicated stories. They asked sort of deep, heavy moral questions. And they really told people that they said, look, comics can be for adults. Comics can be for grown-ups, too. And he is so honored and revered in the comic book world that the award for comics is called the Eisner Award. <laughs> so it's like the Academy Award of Comics. Now, Will Eisner mentored another guy named Art Spiegelman. And Art Spiegelman is incredibly important, too, because in the 1980s, uh, we have what we call the comic renaissance. And this is really where comics grow up. And it, it didn't happen overnight. There's actually a lot of comics in the 70s that sort of led up to this. But in the 1980s, you start to see comics tackle heavier, darker, more, uh, you know, more adult material. And Art Spiegelman wrote a book called Mouse, a graphic novel about his father, uh, who was a, uh, his, both of his parents, actually, who were Jews, who survived the Holocaust, who were both sent to concentration camps. And the story is told like almost like a kid's comic. It's told with animals. The Jews are portrayed as mice. Nazis are the cats. Americans are dogs, I think. Polish are pigs. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a scene where uh, our hero is disguised as a Polish man, and so he's shown wearing a pig mask. But Mouse is incredibly dark. It's incredibly sad. It's about the Holocaust. It's about the extermination of six million Jews, and it's also about Art Spiegelman's relationship with his father. So it's very adult themes, and his father is a complicated character in these books, because while his father is sort of brave and survived the, the Holocaust through, a lot of times, through his intelligence and his wits, he can be very difficult and, and a cruel man himself. And it won pretty much every award a book can win. Um, it's considered by some to be one of the great works of literature of the 20th centuries, and it's taught in college English classes around the world. And it's the only comic to have won 
what is known as the Pulitzer Prize, which is a prestigious award for writing. Mao sort of changes everything. And before I continue talking about Jack Kirby, I want to talk a little bit about the Comic Code's authority. Um, so, in the 1950s, um, Congress held a series of hearings about the negative influence that comics had on children. And part of the reason for this, in the 1950s, there was a series of horror comics that were very gory and violent that uh, people were afraid were a bad influence on children. And so what the comic, various, the various comic book companies got together and they decided, look, we don't want some government body censoring us. So instead, we will censor ourselves. We will form our own association, the Comic Magazines Association of America, as an alternative, uh, alternative to this government regulation. And uh, this way we can police ourselves and um, uh, um, we won't have to worry about the government doing it, doing it for us. And so what they basically did is they decided that you couldn't glorify violence. And here's a list of some of the things, like no crime shall be presented in a way to create sympathy for the criminal. Policemen, judges, governments, and officials and respected institutions shall never be presented in a way to create disrespect. Um, good shall always triumph over evil. Scenes of excessive, let me get, where's my thing? Scenes of excessive violence are to be prohibited. No brutal torture, no horror, excessive bloodshed, no profanity, obscenity, smut, no snudity or sex scenes, no perversions, that kind of stuff. And these basically remained in place until around 2001, until finally Marvel just went, eh. People had been ignoring it for a long time anyway, and so it was just more or less abandoned as sort of social mores changed, right? But this also, you know, sort of aided in this feeling that comics were caused delinquency. Comics were not something to be taken seriously. In fact, comics could have a negative effect on people. And so th this definitely aided in that kind of perception. And so when Jack Kirby and, and uh, um, Stan Lee started to initiate sort of what we call the Silver Age of Comics in the 1960s, you know, they were working under, as you can see here in the upper right hand corner, this, this comics code, which you know, gave these rather strict sort of rules and regulations. So, in class, we're going to talk about Jack Kirby's art, and we're going to talk about really um, what makes it so dynamic. But I do want to look a little bit here. Um, this is a, a work by a guy named Kurt Swan of Superman around the same time, so I, I want to give you a comparison. Now, you'll notice in Jack Kirby's work, the, the action is much more dramatic and dynamic, and he's doing some things here to make that happen. You'll notice the extreme foreshortening with this massive fist here uh, and the small boot in the background. This was something Jack Kirby learned from Renaissance art. Jack Kirby never w went to art school. He was not professionally trained. But he learned by going to the library and checking out books on Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. And he, over time, and you can actually see Jack Kirby getting better. I mean, if you compare the rather sort of flat, awkward looking Captain America here, compared to this Captain America made 40 years later, the differences are enormous. And not only do we have this exciting, dramatic sort of foreshortening, we have this use of linear perspective to give the world in the background sort of three-dimensional weight. Notice Jack Kirby fills his panels with just action everywhere. There's never a dull spot. There's always people or flames or buildings or something going on. And very famously, these little dots are known as Kirby dots. And in some cases, they're not meant to actually represent anything. They just, they're just there to fill the space and form these kind of abstract patterns that create something exciting to look at. And also what Jack Kirby did is he, he messed with the proportions of the figures. He exaggerated the proportions. Because Jack Kirby, I think better than anybody, 
understood that these are superheroes. These are these superheroes have more in common with Greek gods than they do with people who fight crime, right? The, with like a policeman or something. These are larger than life, bigger than life, unrealistic kinds of stories. And so Jack Kirby blew up these proportions. I mean, look at Captain America's shoulder. It's bigger than his head. His thigh is like the size of my entire torso. These are massive figures. And they're exciting and dramatic and they move in exciting ways with that foreshortening. And it's just a whole lot of fun to work at, look, uh, look at. And if you, if you look at um, Superman over here with his dinky little ding, breaking his chains, it's rather boring. It's rather boring. Um, Jack Kirby, guys. Jack Kirby um, produced tens of thousands of, of pages of comics throughout his life. Uh, the, the standard comic book is 24 pages, more or less. Um, and each page is divided into a series of panels. Sometimes those panels, let me move my guy here, sometimes those panels can be one large panel, like the image on the left, or it can be smaller multiple panels. So Jack Kirby for any average comic book is drawing you know probably anywhere between 100 to 200 different panels of varying sizes. The way comic books were produced and still are relatively is is kind of on an assembly line fashion. Um, it starts with a script so you would have, just like in a movie you have a script writer who would write the script and then you have the illustrator who draws everything in pencil. So Jack Kirby would draw everything in pencil. And then that pencil drawing is taken to an inker, somebody not Jack Kirby, who would then draw black ink over it. And then that is taken to a colorist who would add the color. And then that is at, taken to the letterer who would add the letters, the, the, the dialogue. Although Jack Kirby often did his own lettering as he drew. And so Jack Kirby sometimes is, would be, be working on two, three, four, and even on occasion five comic books in a month. And sometimes he would also be the writer of the comic books and book and not just the artist. So he was cranking out a tremendous amount of artwork. And if you look at these panels, you can really see his style. These are called the pencils or the pencil roughs. And in this image of Thor, um, I, I, you can in this bottom panel especially when Thor hits the ground it's not just with a thud but you have all of these lines just sort of streaking out everywhere and if you look in this panel here you can actually see the Kirby dots <laughs> so there they are um, so, and, and if you if you if you um, uh, look if you look at some of the Marvel movies uh, they actually add Kirby dots in some of them anyway um, Jack Kirby. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is a double page, known as a splash page, splash page of Black Panther that Jack Kirby did. And I love this. Uh, this to me is, is Jack Kirby um, 100%. And if you look at it closely, it, does, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like some of the figures, like where is Black Panther leaping from? And where is this guy coming from? And the angles are all weird. Some people are standing on the ground and others are sort of in the air, but you're not really sure where the ground line is or where. And you know what? It doesn't matter <coughs> because Jack Kirby doesn't really care about realism here. He wants excitement. He wants a page that's engaging. And if you look at, I mean, literally the dozens of things to look at on this page, it's just thrilling and exciting and it's a wonderful composition um, and Jack Kirby obviously hated negative space because there's very little of it here he, he had ab abhorred a vacuum and he filled every single inch with something to look at and the reason I'm spending so much time on Jack Kirby is because he's incredibly important um, he's without a doubt the most influential comic book artist of the 20th century and Jack Kirby, like many of his fellow artists, did not retain the rights or all of the rights to some of his characters. I think he had some share in Captain America, but he still made very little for creating 
many of these great characters. Now, he didn't die broke or penniless by any means, and certainly he's, his name is very recognized in the comic book world, but he didn't die a multimillionaire. You know, Jack Kirby, um, you know, worked every day of his life to put food on the table for his family, uh, and that's one of the reasons why he drew so much. It's only been after he's died, after he died, that he's sort of gotten the credit and the recognition, and that his family um, had a lawsuit against Marvel, and they got a sizable um, income. And if you watch any Marvel movie. On the credits, one of the first names you'll see is created by Stanley, of course, Jack Kirby. Will Eisner is a really important figure in the history of comics. Will Eisner started working in the 1940s around the same time that Jack Kirby did. Will Eisner created a character called the Spirit, which was a very popular character in, in uh, newspapers back in the day. But Will Eisner is known also as the father of something called the graphic novel. A graphic novel is a long-form comic book, so a novel-length comic book. And in the 1970s, Will Eisner started to reconsider what comic books could do, what kinds of stories they could tell. And he was influenced by a lot of comics that are called underground comics, comics that were written by artists outside of the mainstream sort of superhero comics. And he wanted to tell more complicated stories, stories that were, you know, often questioned people's morality or uh, tackled social problems, things like that. And he wrote a series of, of graphic novels, and the first one is called A Contract with God, which sort of uh, is based on his childhood. He grew up poor, he grew up in, a, in, in the slums of New York, and uh, he wanted to sort of document the seedier, darker side of modern American life. And his books weren't massive successes, but comic artists and writers loved them because they were adult. They were long-form comics. They told complicated stories. They asked sort of deep, heavy, moral questions. And they really told people that, they said, look, comics can be for adults. Comics can be for grown-ups, too. And he is so honored and revered in the comic book world that the award for comics is called the Eisner Award. <laughs> so it's like the Academy Award of Comics. Now, Will Eisner mentored another guy named Art Spiegelman, and Art Spiegelman is incredibly important, too, because in the 1980s, uh, we have what we call the comic renaissance, and this is really where comics grow up. And it, it didn't happen overnight. There's actually a lot of comics in the 70s that sort of led up to this. But in the 1980s, you start to see comics tackle heavier, darker, more, uh, you know, more adult material. And Art Spiegelman wrote a book called Mouse, a graphic novel about his father, uh, who was a, uh, his, both of his parents, actually, who were Jews, who survived the Holocaust, who were both sent to concentration camps. And the story is told like, almost like a kid's comic. It's told with animals. The Jews are portrayed as mice. Nazis are the cats. Americans are dogs, I think. Polish are pigs. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a scene where uh, our hero is disguised as a Polish man, and so he's shown wearing a pig mask. But Mouse is incredibly dark. It's incredibly sad. It's about the Holocaust. It's about the extermination of six million Jews, and it's also about Art Spiegelman's relationship with his father. So it's very adult themes, and his father is a complicated character in these books, because while his father is sort of brave and survived the, the Holocaust through, a lot of times, through his intelligence and his wits. He can be very difficult and, and a cruel man himself. And it won pretty much every award a book can win. Um, it's considered by some to be one of the great works of literature of the 20th centuries, and it's taught in college English classes around the world. And it's the only comic to have won 
what is known as the Pulitzer Prize, which is a prestigious award for writing. Mao sort of changes everything. 